This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't be scared. Won't the Treasurer you. knows the rule on crops. It's coal. When Scott Morrison brandished a lump of coal in the Australian Parliament, it was a signal to the world that this is coal country. Coal is one of Australia's biggest export commodities, generating billions of dollars in trade, and it provides electricity to power Australian manufacturing and light up homes. This coal fired power station, for example, is crucial for powering the state of South Australia. That's why Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, made such an impassioned speech that our economic survival depends on keeping these. What the f? Well, that's a stroke of bad luck. But no, this wasn't an accident or a terrorist act plunging South Australia into darkness. It's the last coal-fired power station being decommissioned by its owners in 2016. So how's the state doing without any power? Actually, it's doing quite well. This statistic astonished me when I heard it, and maybe you'll be bowled over too. If it was an independent country, South Australia would now rank second in the world, after Denmark, in the use of variable renewable power. It's doing what so many people in the federal government claimed was impossible and is thriving on renewable energy. Now, before cynics start flooding the comments section with questions about what happens when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, let's backtrack a little. In 2006, South Australia had almost no renewable energy at all. It was dependent on coal and gas. Then, under a left-of-centre Labour state government, South Australia began replacing them with wind and solar power. It had an ambitious plan to produce 50% of its power from renewable resources. By contrast, the national targets were 50% renewable by 2050. Within just 10 years, South Australia had replaced all its coal-fired power with renewable power, and that's when it decommissioned the last of its coal-fired power stations. What could possibly go wrong? The move towards renewable energy was heavily criticised by the federal government, which was run by the right-of-centre Liberal National Coalition. I know the word liberal is confusing here. Unlike Canada, the Liberal Party in Australia is the Conservative Party on the right of politics. In other words, it's this, not this. So why don't I just call them Conservatives to avoid confusion? After a huge storm caused blackouts across the state in 2016, federal government leaders called South Australia's move towards renewable energy a failed experiment. Businesses are investing millions of dollars in backup generators. That's the great achievement of the Labor Party's energy policy in South Australia. They invited in this high uptake of renewables, the highest on a per capita basis anywhere in the world. Now, this big experiment failed. Actually, the story's a bit more complicated than that. The main cause of the statewide blackout was infrastructure damage caused by a storm, but some of the criticism was justified. Power was intermittent when renewable sources weren't working, and South Australia had the second most expensive electricity in the country. And this was something of an experiment so even beyond the storm and the blackout, there was a problem with South Australia's renewable energy programme. At times the system was producing way too much energy that couldn't be stored, and at other times it wasn't producing enough, and had no backup, except to import electricity from neighbouring states. So the South Australian government decided to get around the problem with another experiment, the world's largest battery, to be built by Tesla at a place called Hornsdale. This is going to be the largest battery installation in the world by a significant margin. Um, the, the, this is a 100 megawatt uh, battery installation. The next biggest battery uh, system in the world is 30 megawatts. So we're talking about something that is more than three times as powerful as the next biggest battery installation in the world. And because so far this story is playing out along stereotypical political lines, a battery must be left-wing, so the politically correct position for a Conservative government has to be this. By all means, have the world's biggest battery, have the world's biggest banana, have the world's biggest prawn, um, like we have on the roadside, along the highways, around the country. But that's not solving the problem. Well, there's only one way to find out. But hold on, because I still haven't finished the story. In 2018, there was an election in South Australia, 
and the idealistic, Chardonnay-sipping, politically correct, green-loving, snowflake lefty government, led by Jay Wetherill, got booted out. And in his place came the new Premier, Stephen Marshall. Hang on, that's not right. Oh, there he is. It's a joke. I know him. He won't mind. Anyway, he came to power heading the tough-talking right-wing shoot-first, ask-questions-later macho government of the Liberal Party, the same party of Australia's current Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. The party of coal. So now that they're back in power in South Australia, they're going to fulfil their promises to pull back the reckless targets for renewable energy, cancel the battery deal with Tesla, and go back to using electricity based on the tough, manly pursuit of digging up and burning coal, right? But no, they didn't. They realised that the experiment was succeeding, for reasons we'll see, and that consumers, energy companies and industry wanted to keep it. So instead of scrapping the green-loving snowflake lefty program, the new Conservative government massively expanded it. New and bigger wind and solar farms were planned and built, and the target for renewable energy was raised even higher. Even the Hornsdale battery was enlarged, and this time, for some reason, there were no comparisons to a big banana. I wonder why. So under a right-wing government, South Australia is now at 70% renewable energy and aiming for 90% by 2025. Senior politicians in the federal government had warned that the push for renewables in South Australia would lead to an unreliable power supply and higher electricity prices. The reality is that since the Hornsdale battery has been built, the electricity supply in South Australia has been pretty stable and even has advantages over coal and gas. One of the headaches of grid engineers is trying to regulate the output of electricity from power stations to meet demand, which varies throughout the day. Here's the response time of coal and gas-fired power stations, and here's the response time of the Hornsdale battery, which is measured in milliseconds. For energy companies, this is less wasteful, much more economical and much more efficient. The Hornsdale battery has been so successful that it's produced windfall profits for its owner, the French company Neoen, and paid for itself within just a few years, and so successful that it's been expanded from 100 megawatts to 150 megawatts. As for the cost of renewable energy, it's now so cheap that South Australia has turned from having the second most expensive electricity in Australia during the coal-burning era to the cheapest. And the renewable energy program has sparked new industries and innovations, like Sundrop Farm, which is using solar energy to turn seawater into freshwater. Prior to this innovation, the semi-arid land on which the farm sits was only able to support three cows. Now it has an abundance of water taken from the sea and produces 14% of Australia's tomatoes. And for people who have no idea what those are, they're tomatoes. Government officials in South Australia also have their eye on attracting international firms that need cheap renewable energy as a power source. Because increasingly, countries that are signed up to treaties limiting carbon emissions will penalise companies that have a high carbon footprint. Whether you agree with that or not, that's the reality. And this is how we now get to the current position of South Australia having the second highest uptake of variable renewable energy in the world, if it was an independent country. The state government not only met its renewable energy targets, it exceeded them. But for some pundits, speaking in the year 2020, it's still 1995. Renewables are nice if they work, but they're expensive, unreliable, impractical, and frankly, a bit of a con. I guess that after pushing the same message for 20 years, based on technology that's 30 years old, it's hard to change direction. The success of renewable energy in South Australia is reflected in plans to build a huge renewable energy hub that will produce 1.2 gigawatts of wind and 600 megawatts of solar, backed up by a battery with 1.8 gigawatts of storage, ten times bigger than the original Hornsdale battery. So South Australia could soon be producing far more electricity than it needs, nearly all from wind and solar, and much cheaper than neighbouring states. What will it do with all that cheap, clean energy? One answer, which is now being trialled with a pilot plant, is to split water molecules 
and produce hydrogen and then export it to countries like Japan and South Korea that are also switching away from coal and oil and looking ahead to a hydrogen fueled economy. Liquid sunshine, as one Australian engineer described it. I spoke about this in my video, A Conservative Solution to Climate Change. This video is really a practical example of what I was saying in that video, which of course was all my opinion. A vision of the future that's not calling for world government and state control, but a free enterprise solution that should be easily adopted by both sides of the political equation. Now we can see what happens when we put that into practice. A measure of the success in South Australia is that other states like Victoria and New South Wales are now trying to emulate it, building similar renewable energy farms backed by battery storage. And again, this goes across party lines. New South Wales has a conservative government. Victoria is left-wing. In another video, my previous one, I asked the question, do you get it now? And clearly, most of the states do, but there's also some encouraging news in the media. News International, which dominates Australia's media and is owned by Rupert Murdoch, who also owns Fox News, The Wall Street Journal and The New York Post, has spent decades downplaying or even denying the link between carbon dioxide and global temperature. And, of course, rubbishing renewable energy. But almost overnight, it's announced a major editorial shift. Apparently, they do now accept the science, at least here in Australia. They finally figured out that carbon dioxide does cause global warming and that something needs to be done about it, and that renewable energy is now a good thing. After scientists have been warning about this for decades, Murdoch and his editors suddenly decided they were right. But during those decades, News International has been spoon-feeding millions of readers and viewers a steady diet of slanted scientific nonsense that I've been debunking on my channel, splashing opinions from scientists with no qualifications in climate science and pundits who never passed high school science and even an op-ed piece written by a special correspondent who turned out to be an anonymous flack working for a resources industry lobby group. Well, I suppose it took the Roman Catholic Church over 350 years to finally admit that Galileo was right, the Earth does orbit the Sun, and it took creationists half a century to admit that animals do change over time, to the point where they can no longer interbreed. So it does take a while for entrenched ideological and religious beliefs to finally succumb to science. But isn't it nice to see what can be done when everyone does listen to the science and the ideological bickering stops.